Hello. This is the class after the class. How you doing, Franklin? How you doing, George? Thanks for bearing with me. Just running a couple minutes behind here today. Struggling with this. Uh, uh, Struggling with what? With uh, FileZilla. Oh, you know what? I don't like FileZilla very much. If you prefer, use WinSCP. And there's a there's a client and. Uh, Actually, that's a good available. question. I'm not sure if there's a server of WinSCP. I know there's a server of FileZilla, uh, but FileZilla is not the best one. There, there are a couple of others that are that are FTP server programs. So, for if I download WinSCP, do I need to download that? Uh, let's say uh, one on the virtual machine and one on my machine as well, or? Um, actually, you know what you can do is. <clears throat> when you're doing that assignment franklin for those of you that don't know what franklin's talking about that's the wireshark assignment that I'm, I'm forcing the grad students to do um it's optional for the undergrad students you don't have to use two different computers you could use your own computer the same computer and run both the server application and the client application on the same computer and then the ip address that you go to is just the ip address of that computer from the client, or you can go to 127.0.0.1, which is an internal IP address that your computer uses to talk to itself. So okay. the only thing that's really critical, frankly, on being able to complete that Wireshark is being able to download and install an FTP server application, and then download and install an FTP client application, and then attempt to upload and download a file uh, from one uh, from uh, from and to your com to to those applications. Um, now, if you use if you want to use Wireshark to capture it, um, you you probably do need to use the actual real IP address. Now that I think about it, or Wireshark won't see it. It'll just be internal. Uh, you want to see it on the Ethernet card. So the best way to do it is use two different computers, but you don't have to. Might want to just try it on your on your local computer first. Okay. Yeah, I, I tried downloading um that FileZilla um by yeah. virtual machine and on my machine. Yeah. But uh I couldn't get them to connect at all. So well there may be a couple of reasons for that, Frank. That may be that see with FileZilla, um, first of all, are you on the VPN? Are you connecting? Are you did you load if you load FileZilla on your machine in the in the lab on the windows 7 machine you have to be connected via vpn to the lab and be able to communicate with that computer in okay. other words you guys yeah. want to wait for just a minute uh let me let me share a screen and i will show you uh, what you would need to do to, to do that experiment and make that work okay so first of all, I'm going to close everything that looks sensitive first. Bear with me a second here. Right now, you're just seeing my second screen, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so I'm going to remote view a computer, my my Windows 7 virtual machine in the lab here. And I'm pretty sure I already have files uh, not only on it, but I think it's actually running right now. And so for those of you that are participating in this class after the last class, I appreciate that, guys. You'll get a little bit of extra insight. Uh, oh, that's what I need to do. I need to do that first just so I can see what's going on on the screen here. Oh, no, that's a little 
Yeah, no, it looks like I shut down the phone. So, okay, so Franklin, do you have access to this Windows 7 machine in the lab? Well, not this particular one, but your Windows 7 machine. Yes, but I, I, I use the uh, Chrome remote desktop to access it. Okay, so here's the deal. If you're, and that's fine that you use the Chrome remote desktop, but you need to also have the VPN connection uh, running because, let me go ahead and pull up my VPN connection. They have to be basically on the same local network and they're not going to be on the same local network because you can't get through the firewall. You understand what I'm saying? Can't, can't cut. So you got to connect to the EI Lab VPN here. I'm going to connect real quick. Yeah, I tried even connecting straight um, to turn off the firewall on my computer and then connecting straight to the modem instead of going through the router so I wouldn't be behind the NAT, but that also didn't work. Okay, so we just need to make sure a couple of things here. Um, first of all, what's the IP address of my workstation here in the, on the EI Lab network? It is, can you guys see that okay or do I need to blow that back up? No, let me blow that back up. I shouldn't even bother to ask. There we go. So it's 192.168.1.103. Yours is going to be 192.168.1. something else. You need to make sure that you actually first have network access to it. If you don't, then you won't be able to do it the, the way that it is described in the notes with two different computers. Okay, so there's 1.103. Um, here's my outside computer here. I'm going to fire up the command line. And I'm just going to try to ping 192.168.1.103. Says I can ping it. I'm going to try to do a trace route to it, trace RT, because I want to see what the actual path is. <clears throat> I'm going to do a minus D so it doesn't bother looking up DNS information. Otherwise, it goes a lot slower. Okay, it says it's. Uh, See, make sure that's a yeah yeah okay so that was VPN it, it's not showing the path supposedly on that local network which is a good thing so let's see ARP let's do this ARP minus A I see 192.168.1.103 now you'll notice by the way this is interesting I'm just going to point this out while guys but people are here is when you do an ARP minus A to see if you can see MAC addresses, it'll only show you MAC addresses, here, these up here, of the physical networks you're attached to. We're not seeing MAC addresses of any of the VPN machines that I'm um, connected to. So in other words, I don't see anything in the lab there. But you see all those other numbers? 172 and 192, those are all IP addresses of <coughs> servers and some workstations, workstations that may be running server programs at U of H. But I don't see any MAC addresses. Uh, that really has not as much to do with Wireshark, but that's interesting to note. Um, so now I want to see if I can access 192.168.1.103. Uh, let me see if I've got FileZilla server installed. I'm pretty sure if we have it in the back of my phone. There's the FileZilla server. Now FileZilla in FTP runs on two different ports, which need to be open in your local computer's firewall, or in the in the server computer's firewall, port 21 and port 22. See how it says you appear to be in that behind in that firewall. We're not going to worry about that for right now. I'm going to see if I can talk to that thing. I need to see what uh, I need to see what my user passwords are. I don't remember any of them. J for the uh, change the password just temporarily or otherwise. That's a big ass long password, okay. I'm just gonna change it to one, two, three, four, five, six right now. And 
then from my outside computer here, which is supposedly VPN, I'm going to try running my WinSCP, or you could have downloaded the FileZilla client program as well. I'm going to create a new site. I'm going to use first, just try to use FTP by itself, not SFTP, but FTP because this is in the Wireshark. And for those of you that are paying attention right now, by the way, guys, this is good to pay attention to even if you don't do the Wireshark extra credit, but you might wanna do the Wireshark extra credit because I'm showing you how to do some of it right now. Uh, so FTP, no encryption, 192.168.1.103. Username is Jake. I made the password for this test, 123456, just to make it nice and easy. I say, yeah, I'll say the password, what the heck going on? I'll click log in. It says it's connecting. I'm not seeing anything. Now that might be that I don't have FTP activated in FileZilla. I might have SFTP activated. So let's just click OK. And let's assume that that's, that's the case, that it's not FTP, it's SFTP. So I'll change it to SFTP, which will change that port number to 22 automatically. Save that. Now I'll try to log in. It doesn't appear to be working. So now we need to check, and I don't know if I put this in my notes. I don't know if this is in the assignment, but we probably need to add that. What's probably getting in the way here is the Windows firewall. So first of all, let me let me check my server settings here. Yeah, I turned off all my Windows firewall also, and that wasn't working. Oh, maybe I didn't. Maybe I needed to do that. That's probably what I needed to do. Let me go back to my CP. Actually, while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and check my server settings. Lesson on port 21. Now, this is just for plain FTP number of threads to blah, blah, blah. that it's not even enabled so i should be able to just talk to it on port 21. i'm going to turn that on just in case disable ip check users cannot securely log in okay so that tells me that it's just ftp port 21. All right, let me go back to this. I'm going to change this back to just plain old FTP. Save, login. And you say you turn your firewalls off, but just for the sake of everybody else who's paying attention to this, either now or watching the video later on, let's go through that procedure. So Windows Firewall, this is the would be the Windows Firewall of that server machine. So I've got to click on this start button here, the machine running the server. And I'm going to go to the Windows Firewall settings. The easiest way to find them is just start typing in the word Firewall. Windows Firewall with advanced security, I'm going to go there. Bring up this program. Uh, if it doesn't bring this up, if it brings up a more general screen, one of the buttons that you can click on over on this left pane will be advanced settings. Then it should bring up this screen. So it says my Windows firewall is on. I could turn it off, but rather than doing that, I want to show you guys what the inbound rules and the outbound rules look like. So if I click on inbound rules here, I can look and see if I have any inbound rules 
that are either permitting or denying file transfer protocol or FTP. Let's see port number in this listing here. So I'm either going to look for something that says FTP or FileZilla. I don't see anything. So what there really needs to be is there needs to be a new inbound rule and, an, and a new outbound. Well, there needs to be an outbound rule, definitely. Let's not worry about inbound rule. There definitely needs to be an outbound rule. Well, there needs to be both, inbound and outbound rule, excuse me, speaking out of turn. Let me go back to inbound rule. Let's just go ahead and try creating a new inbound rule, new rule. I do it by port number. I could do it by program and choose Firefox, excuse me, not Firefox, FileZilla. But I want to just make a generic rule for any FTP server program that I install, which is going to be using port 28. So I'll say let's do it based on port number. Uh, we can make a rule based on TCP or UDP. So it, you have to look up and see what the application is using. Most of them use TCP, FTP is TCP. It's not streaming, it's a reliable protocol, for, so it's definitely TCP. Sometimes when you're opening firewalls, when you read the instructions, it will tell you, make a rule for TCP and UDP, and there'll be a little slash there. You have to do two. So I'll click. Uh, next, does that rule apply to all local ports? Actually, excuse me, all local ports. That's the source port. Mm. Oh, excuse me, no, it's an inbound rule, so I do need to, I need to definitely specify port 21, I apologize. Specific local ports 21, this will be the inbound port. Allow the connection. I'll do that for all of those three locations. I'll call that FTP 21. Something like that. Okay, so there, there it is. It says it is able, it allows any program. I'm trying to make this bigger. There it is. That's what I was looking for. And actually, now I can put this in order of port number too. See if I, I was seeing if I already saw one for rule 21. Okay, so I don't see any, but now I definitely have a filter, a rule that supposedly is allowing traffic in on port 21. I probably also want to allow traffic out on port 21 as well. So I'm going to create a reciprocal outbound rule. So rather than what, what you've done, Franklin, by disabling your firewall or turning it off, you've potentially made your computer vulnerable. I don't recommend doing that. I used to, just for purposes of experimentation, but I try not to anymore because invariably people forget or they get lazy or they get complacent and they leave their firewall off and they can potentially have a problem after that. So I don't want to get anybody in trouble. It looks like Allow this connection. Yeah, I turned them on and I'm doing what you're doing right now. So. Or you could have even made, we could have made it a just FTP generic and put 21 through 22 as well. But I just want to do one at a time. Now let's see if that worked, okay? I'm just going to exit that. It might not work, but we'll see if it works. 
And another way we could definitely test this, assuming that it's the VPN getting in the way, is you could run WinSCP on the local computer itself, which is what I was going to suggest earlier. Let's just try doing that first, okay? So I'm running a FTP server program in the background, and then here's the client program on that actual machine. FTP. I'm going to try 127.0.0.1 first, okay? That should definitely work. For those of you that don't remember that or don't know that 127.0.0.1, that's your computer's own internal IP address called loopback or localhost that it uses to talk with itself so that you can have a server program out here and a client program talking to each other within the same computer. It's kind of like your, the left half of your brain and the right half of your brain talking to each other, but they require, um, <coughs> they require an address from left to right side. And sometimes there, is a, there are very good reasons why your computer needs to talk to itself. It's so that you can write in individual separate applications and not have to worry about, well, is my application talking to another a server version of the application running on this computer? It can just use the same code instead of putting in a real IP address of something in the world or uh.edu. You can use that 127.0.0.1 address. So let's log in and see if that works. Okay, so that works. Okay, so that's probably what we should have done first. That proves to us that the FTP server program is working. Uh, now I'm going to log out. Or oh, I'm just going to close that. Now I'm going to go to the WinSCP program that's running out here on my outside computer, the one that's not the. Uh, and that is working. I can already tell because it's saying right now it's going a lot, obviously a lot slower because I'm going through a VPN connection. Can I retrieve directory listing? Well, screw you. weird that it couldn't retrieve a directory listing. It might be that there's a firewall rule that I need for, maybe it's using UDP for that. Let's go ahead and just turn the firewall off now. The thing I said don't do. Let's try that. But we got a little further is the point. I don't know, this is kind of fun in experimentation, I think. Firewall. Now for Windows Firewall, you can turn off the firewall uh, and actually this is not, I don't want to be in the advanced part of this. I want to be in the Windows generic firewall. I want to be in just go there, not with advanced security, just Windows Firewall. There we go. That's the screen I was looking at. So you'll notice that I have the firewall enabled for all networks, my local private networks, which you can turn that off. So let's just turn it off for there. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it off for the domain, eilab.bower.uh.edu. But I'm going to leave it on for public networks. And let's see if that's good enough, OK? I'll bet you that's good enough. So now let's come back to WinSCP here. And let's, there we go. So what did that tell us, Franklin, or anybody else? That just opening port 21 on TCP wasn't good enough. I bet you what we had to do, Franklin, is we had to go also open up port UDP, uh, port 21 on the UDP protocol as well, 
because the TCP is used to set up the session and UDP is probably what's used to update the listing of files because that's something that changes pretty often a lot of times on some people's computers. And that's, um, it's not critical that you see the changes every time or, or once per second or whatever, just that it eventually gets updated. In other words, you d that's probably what they're doing. I'm not gonna bother wasting time doing that experiment, but you guys can certainly do that experiment. So do you think you can move a little further along now, Franklin, with this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess we'll see. Like I said, I, I, I have, I turned off the firewalls on you, both. You turned I off all the firewalls. Yeah, I just turned off all the firewalls just to be, and then um, I've got that before that, all those okay. green and blue lines, but I've never actually, especially on FileZilla, I've never actually got it to connect. And there's like a test on the FileZilla website okay. that you go to test your server. Right. And I just can't seem to connect to the server. Um, you mean, it, it, okay, so you're trying to use the FileZilla little local host test, right? Right, and yeah, and, and it just won't connect to Where's my... That? Um, Is that somewhere here? No, it's 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 a little. Um, let me see. Look, it's. Is it is it a separate program that they send with FileZilla? No, it, it's not a. Um, it's it's not a program. It's a website that you go to. Oh, okay. See, that's not going to work. Can't go to a website because it's trying to talk to 192.138.194.45. So that will never work. So here's what I recommend that you do, Franklin. If you've got FileZilla working on your workstation in the EI lab or on your workstation at home where you are right now, and you, you have this screen and you've set up a user, you know, you've gone to the, the settings here. I believe all that's the default. I think the only thing I changed down here was, um, I think I changed something. Where did I change it? Oh, security settings, I probably turned that off, but I don't think that mattered much. And then I downloaded on the same computer and installed WinSCP just to make sure I can talk to myself. So see if you can do that while I continue on to um, the, we'll finish chapter 12 notes today, okay? And for everybody else trying that out. So yeah, that's not gonna work unless you're running a public FTP server with a real public IP address, or there's a rule in the public firewall, the public facing firewall that points any FTP access to your workstation, and there isn't. The only way there would be is if you told me, hey Jake, can you please go add a, a, a rule temporarily in the firewall that points all FTP traffic, AKA this thing in the world here, that you just typed in, the FTP test.net. Um, go to 192.138.194.45 colon 21. Or I could, you know, I could, you could run it on a different port even. You can say, hey, go run my server on port 2001 or 22201. But for purposes of the instructions, we want you to use the standard port 21, which is because that's what we're used to seeing FTP running on. Okay, so try that a little bit later. Let me bring up chapter 12 again. Let's get through that. For the benefit of everybody else, it will be taking the test. Hopefully before Sunday at midnight. Or Saturday. I think I'm, I'm giving you till Saturday at midnight. Today's Wednesday, right? Or is today just Tuesday? Or today's only Tuesday. Oh, that's plenty of time, isn't it? To study the easier chapters 10 through 12. It'll be nice and fresh in your mind. Oh, you're taking a long time. What's going on? Close some of this other stuff. Thank you. 
Maybe it's downloading an update. Who knows? Okay, we were somewhere around. I was just talking about, or I started talking about management and managed devices. There is a protocol. Don't confuse this with the email protocol called SMTP. This is SNMP. It is a very good protocol. Simple network management protocol. It's called simple network protocol because it's fairly simple. <coughs> There's not a lot of data that comes out of it. But it is the most commonly used protocol. It's a standard, an industry standard. Many, many, many different brands of switches and even servers, routers, mostly connecting devices, not typically workstations. You don't see SNMP on workstations or even on access points, but you do see it on anything that's called managed. So if you were to go Google for managed switch and you can to see if you wanted to purchase one or not, let me bring up a, open up a Chrome window here. Let's just go Google for managed switch 48 port and I'll just type in SNMP. Let's just see what we get. And $500 minimum is typically the average price I've seen for a 48 port managed switch. There's Ubiquity, has got one, TP-Link actually has one for a pretty good price. I like TP-Link, so let's look up theirs real quick. Yeah, there's their Jetstream, which is pretty good. Let's go take a look at the specs for this 48 port switch. Sometimes you'll find that these switches are actually 52 ports because they have four high-speed ports, which are what those things are. So let me just go ahead and talk about that while I'm here. Go ahead. View the full product details. Not always, but 99% of the time, if you see something called managed, that means not only can you log into it with a web page, and that's not always the case. Some of the older Juniper switches and older HP switches, they don't have a web GUI, but they're still called managed because they have the capability of putting out SNMP data. So I'm just gonna Google for it. There it is right there. So this device is easy to use and manage. It supports various user-friendly standard management features such as an intuitive web-based web -based GUI. So, oh good, it's got a GUI, which makes it the easiest just to make these switches have a GUI. So you can log into them and set up the management because you have to set up a, a username and a password so that your managed software, which is typically an automated script that runs every few minutes, can run, log into that switch based on the switch's IP address, a username and a password, and then download current data out of it. Current number of bits in and out, number of users on the switch, number of ports that are busy, whether there's drop data, all of that is specified in the SNMP protocol. There's a, uh, an information base called a MIB or a mes message information base. And there are specified um, fields for the standard things that you would want to know about connecting devices like bits in, bits out, port number, bits per second, the total number of bits. So it supports SNMP and another one called, uh, well, actually our monitor, remote monitor is part of SNMP. Enables the switch to be polled for valuable status. So that's what's going on with SNMP. You can use a program such as, let me minimize this, I'm a little smaller there. You can use a program, any program which is SNMP compliant, such as MRTG, which is a very old program, 
it's an open source program it was written a long time ago it's called multi-router traffic grapher it's an open source program so a lot of other companies have used the source code and created new versions of it like prtg and you know ssrtg or name it whatever they want but what it does basically is it logs in periodically and you tell it first of all you give it a list of switches to go look at you give it an ip address of a switch to look at you put in a username and a password of that